Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to Gary Grigsby's Bombing the Reich. This is from uh, the Matrix game uh, Eagle Day to Bombing the Reich, a remake of a couple of Talonsoft games uh, called Eagle Day and Bombing the Reich, respectively, uh, which were released in the 1990s. Matrix games re-released this, sort of repackaged it and re-released it, I believe in 2009, and it allows you to play either of the two original games. We're playing uh, Bombing the Reich, which puts you in the shoes of the Allies or the Germans during the combined bomber offensive from 1943 to 1945. This is the third day of the campaign, so we're on to August 19th, 1943. We've begun our campaign here uh, by targeting several oil facilities and also the city of Emden up here, uh, and uh, begun to sort of shift our targets into the chemical weapons facilities, or not chemical weapons, uh, chemical factories, rather, uh, to try and disrupt German synthetic oil production. Um, that's sort of my focus in, ad in addition to destroying the Luftwaffe. So we've destroyed a bunch of these oil storage facilities. Now we're going after the chemical factories, which will allow the Germans to build oil. So the idea is destroy the oil that's currently in storage, then shift your attention to destroying the factories which produce the oil, and see if you can choke off the Luftwaffe from being able to uh, fly sorties against you. And then if they can't fly sorties against you, you can kind of bomb whatever you want to bomb at will uh, and win the war easily. Now, with that being said, uh, I have sort of a secondary portion of this campaign, which is the British Combined Bomber Offensive, or the British Night Bombing Offensive, against Emden. Now, last we checked, we saw the damage against Emden was 90%. The damage against Emden now appears to only be 45%. Uh, between ending the last turn and starting this one, the damage has fallen to 45%, so I don't know if that means that uh, our intelligence is faulty or what. But in any event, uh, it does appear to be uh, not as destroyed as I would hope. Now, to me, if we click on this urban f urban uh, button, which shows us the urban areas, Emden does appear to be destroyed. Now, the one thing I don't quite understand is the ports also appear to be urban areas, and those aren't destroyed at all, while the urban area itself is at about 45% damage. So um, there's that. And I need to look into the rules a little bit more to try and understand that a little bit better. I don't think you get terror points uh, for bombing the ports, which you can do with night bombing raids, but uh, the ports here don't, don't say they do anything for urban damage, so I'm not sure here. You can see if we go into the rules, it says ports contribute to the industrial strength of the Reich. Destroying ports can cripple Axis industrial power. Okay, but if we go to area, you can see areas represent population centers, i.e. towns, suburbs, etc. Bombing area targets or terror bombing increases Axis terror, which goes toward achieving victory in many campaigns. Click the urban button to turn the map view to urban. Uh, and the urban areas on the map will show up as red circles. The more red and black spots, uh, sorry, the more red and black spots show where the most damage is at. So to me, if I click this button, that's telling me that ports are urban areas and that the city itself and the ports are separate urban targets, which I guess I didn't know or I don't know. I'm not quite sure. Again, I'll have to look into more detail in the rules. But in any event, uh, this portion of Emden appears to be destroyed pretty heavily, but the Emden Jade and the Emden Ems Werft uh, less so. With that being said, uh, this is going to be a little bit of a lighter turn. And the reason I wanted to show this video is I've had multiple requests in my last video to say, listen, you showed us the results, you showed us sort of what combat looks like. What you haven't shown us is how you actually create a mission. Like, how do you plot a mission course? How do you say who you're going to target? What What do you do? How do you actually bomb someone and I figured hey that makes sense that's a that's a logical request why don't we go ahead and spend this turn trying to teach that so if you may recall in our last turn we did attempt to bomb uh, the Bailey Petro oil facility and the Kuhlman chem works in Paris so both of these are in the outskirts of Paris one is an oil storage facility uh, and one is a chemical factory we're going to bomb the chemical factory uh, we're going to go ahead and click this because we didn't do much damage to it in the last raid. Uh, so actually, if we go back here, if we hit, uh, if we want to do a bombing raid, essentially we've got multiple options. We can do a fighter sweep, we can do recon missions, night intruders, or bombing missions. For this sake, let's do a bombing mission, which means it's going to be a daytime raid. We'll go ahead and select the target that we want, which is the Kuhlman Chem Works. 
uh, last recon one day ago with eight damage, fifteen or sorry, fifteen damage, eight capacity, six heavy anti-aircraft guns, sixteen heavy anti-aircraft guns are located there. So we go ahead and hit the bombing button, and then we can pick a primary target here, for example, which can be the Chemworks. And then theoretically, if we wanted, if the weather was bad or whatever, uh, we can set a secondary target of the oil storage facilities. I've never actually done a secondary target before, but hey. Uh, that's as easy as that. We just clicked it, and that's what happened. Now, you can see here that the altitude auto-populates. Usually, it's at 15,000, but I've already placed a few other raids, so uh, it's at 16,000. We're going to be flying B-17 Flying Fortresses, so we can put those at a little bit higher altitude because they've got a little bit better bomb aiming than some of the medium bombers. Uh, you want to take into effect when you're bombing enemy targets, what is the aircraft you're going to be bombing with? Heavy bombers can bomb from a slightly higher altitude. The lower your altitude, the more vulnerable you are to flak. The higher the altitude, the less vulnerable you are to flak, but the more likely your bombs are to miss their targets. To me, 18,000 is kind of the sweet spot for the heavy bombers. For the tactical bombers, I feel like you need to go a little bit lower because they don't have quite as accurate as a bomb site. So the B-17s use the Norden bomb site, which was a heavily classified and uh, at least for the time, accurate bombing site. The tactical bombers, to my knowledge, did not use the Norden bomb site. And from what I've seen, like the B-26s and B-25s, uh, the Marauders and the Mitchells uh, and the A-20 Havocs, they really don't do well above 15,000 feet. So what my experience tells me is 15,000 is kind of the sweet spot for them. You've got to be really careful, though, because they are a little bit faster, but they are also incredibly vulnerable. The B-17 can take a lot of damage. Uh, the B-25s and B-26s cannot although they tend to die more from uh, tactical fighters than they do from flak, in my experience. Anyway, when you go ahead and you click on the target, you will get an automatically generated route. So the white line here is the ingress route, the flight route that you'll take going into the target. The red map is the outgoing route. Now, I usually try to modify this a little bit. This is actually a pretty good route, but I'm going to go ahead and modify it. I modify it by right-clicking on the item that I want to click on. So I believe this is inbound two and this is inbound one. So you've got up here, you've got inbound one, inbound two, inbound three, initial point and your exit points. So three inbound sort of course corrections and uh, then the initial point, which I believe is where you start the bombing run from, or at least where you kind of go into bombing mode. So I swung this out here, the inbound point, to kind of be further between any targets. The moral of the story for me is don't go over anything, any other targets. Uh, because if I fly over this infantry unit or this radar unit or this area unit, if there's flak guns that are defending those units, they're not going to know I'm not bombing them, so they're going to shoot at me. So if we can kind of navigate our way between these uh, different targets, I think that's uh, generally a sound strategy. At least that's my experience. I am by no means a uh, bombing the Reich expert, but that's sort of my observations. So you can see here we're going to go ahead and uh, sort of create our route just by right clicking and bringing all of these units or all of these routes here as much as possible between the various uh, targets. The other thing you need to keep in mind is like if we were to adjust a route that would run us parallel to the enemy, it also is going to influence how long you're going to be flying. So theoretically I could just go like, whoa, way over here for my route, but then it's going to be a much larger route against much more uh, enemy territory and would lead me vulnerable to enemy attack for a longer period of time. So while you do want to potentially tweak your routes, also realize that the more you tweak it, the more you're going to spend over, potentially, the more you're going to spend over enemy territories, and as a result, the more damage you're, uh, you know, allowing yourself to take because it's going to take longer to get into your target. So I'm going to leave this at 18,000 feet. I'm going to change the time of day. Oops. Um... You can use this button for one hour increments, 10 minute increments, or one minute increments. We're gonna go ahead and have our flight take off at noon uh, so that, uh, where, what time are we gonna be over the target? If we look down here, we can see uh, we will be over the target at 12.28. So actually it'll only take 28 minutes. There's no way that's right. Apparently it is right. So apparently we will start at noon, which is sort of at our, our muster point. Uh, and then we will get over our target within 28 minutes. That seems crazy. Uh, crossing over here in France. So it's a relatively close target, I guess. Um, we can list the targets here, which, 
Well, actually, we're not going to do that. That's just listing all the potential targets. So we've identified the chemical works as our primary. The oil facility is our secondary. We're going to go ahead and at this point pick our lead unit. So who do we want to be leading the bombing strike? Now, usually you want to go with the most experienced unit. When you're looking at British bombing units, you also want to consider the navigation radar. So British bombers bomb at night, and they, or at least British strategic bombers bomb at night. And you always want to pick a unit that has a navigation radar because at night it's hard to navigate. And if you don't have a radar to navigate, you often are going to be very ineffective. Uh, in this case, because all of Europe and Germany especially, you're going to have blackout rules, which prevents you from actually seeing what the heck is going on. So in this case, I know I want to use B-17 Flying Fortresses, B-17F Flying Fortresses. The most experienced bomber group we have is a 303rd bomb group uh, with B-17s. They have a 73 experience. Another key factor is morale. If this was below 50, I would probably not choose them. This is a Gary Grigsby game, so units that fail morale checks sometimes may not even take off. In this case, 62 is pretty healthy morale, so we'll go ahead and select them. Uh, to lead the bombing raid. You can see here their fatigue is six. They haven't flown a mission in two days. So uh, one day means they flew yesterday. Two days means they had yesterday off. So their fatigue is below 10, which is good. Their morale is above 60, which is good. Uh, their base is with the first bomber division at Molesworth. And there are 24 ready aircraft. So a full B-17 bomb group, I believe, has 48 aircraft if all the aircraft are currently uh, sort of healthy and not under repair and are ready for, for combat. In this case, you can see about half the squadron or half the bombing group is not ready, but that's frankly common across all of these units. Most of them have some level of uh, sort of aircraft down for repair, maintenance, those kind of things. So we've got our lead bomb group, the uh, 303rd, and we've got the target selected. We've got the course selected. The next thing we're going to go ahead and do is add additional bomber units. So when you're bombing an enemy target, typically 24 bombers is not going to be enough. Now, I've picked my bombing unit uh, with the uh, experience there. I care less at this point about experience for my other units. Now what I care about principally is morale and fatigue. So I want to pick all bombing units that have less than 10 fatigue. Uh, I think you can bomb okay at 10 fatigue, but all, all my units I want to pick are going to have less than 10 fatigue and 50 or more higher morale. That one ensures the morale check gets passed, so they all end up bombing the target and not like failing to show up for the actual mission. And then the other thing is that they're not too tired. If they're too tired, then what they're likely going to, you know, they're going to be less effective. They may get shot down by the enemy. They may suffer morale penalties. All of, you know, anything that could happen because you're tired, you don't want to happen when you're on a bombing mission. So actually, we're going to go with one of these bombing units with 10 fatigue because I think that's fine. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and pick these, uh, however many bombing uh, groups here. You can see they range from 24 bombers ready to 31 on the high end, and they all have 50 or higher morale. We could theoretically have about a 500 bomber raid, uh, actually 400 and something. Uh, but uh, these units have morale lower than 50. Some of their morale is actually pretty damn low. Uh, and some of them have more than 10 fatigue as well. So we're going to give these four bomb groups the day off. This will also allow them to sort of repair and, and get their aircraft back ready. We're going to go ahead and go to war with these 337 B-17s to bomb the chemical factories near Paris. Now, as any of you know who know anything about the daylight bomber offensive against Germany, it's a bad idea to have B-17 flying fortresses flying into heavily defended enemy territory without fighter escort. So we're going to do that. Fortunately, because we're bombing in Europe and we're bombing in Paris specifically, uh, in France, uh, we're not going to have to worry too much about range, but that is still a factor. So we don't have the P-51 Mustang yet, which means our aircraft are going to have shorter range, uh, shorter duration, which means our bombers have a potential of having to fly without fighter escort. Uh, again, these bombers will not do well if they're flying into enemy territory without fighter escort, so we need to make sure they have as much fighter escort as possible. So what we can do here is we can go ahead and click on the fighter escort, add fighter escorts, and then we can go ahead and see a list of the different squadrons or fighter groups that are available. I'm going to sort first off by fatigue, uh, or sorry, first off by morale and then fatigue. So anyone with 10 or less fatigue is game for me. They all flew yesterday, uh, but most of these units have lower than 10 fatigue. A couple have 10. We'll let them fly. The 64th Squadron of Spitfire 9s, HFs, are British fighter pilots. That's designated by 64 Fighter Squadron rather than, you know, fighter group 
or uh, the naming convention is different. The British have 64 without like the TH. The American units have like a TH with them. So that's kind of how you know who's who. With that being said, 64th Fighter Squadron, Spitfire 9s. You can see here they can follow our fighter or our bombers most of the way into the target. Not quite all the way. They can't quite make it into the target. So the other thing you look at is the range indicator. This is how far they are essentially from the target, I believe. Uh, essentially, the higher the number here, the less likely, uh, depending on the aircraft, that they're going to be able to make it the whole trip. So we know they can't make it the whole trip because the fighter escort will begin here where this green box starts and it will continue along this whole green arrow. Once you get to this little yellow arrow box or this yellow box, that means the fighters will leave the bomber formation at this point because they will be bingo fuel. So you can see here, these fighters can escort the bombers almost all the way into the target, but they have to leave just before the bombing target, and then they will not be with the bombers their whole way home. You can alter that slightly by saying, all right, add, 10 minute, add a 10 minute takeoff delay. So you don't have to fly with the bombers the whole way, Join, you know, take off 10 minutes after uh, the bombers, and then join them mid-flight, which means essentially that they're not going to be crisscrossing above the bomber formation or weaving within the bomber formation, wasting fuel flying slower, potentially less efficient flying. So you can give them 10 minutes until they, they take off, and then they'll join the bombers mid-flight. That gives them a little bit better cover. They actually join them just after they cross into the French uh, sort of territories, and then they can cover them all the way through the target, all the way back on the back leg until just a little bit south of Rouen. Uh, which means most of the sort of ingress point and a good chunk of the egress is covered with these fighters. So we're going to do that. We're going to do each of these three groups here. They all have the same range, uh, and they all are not the same aircraft, apparently. This is a Spitfire 7, so we're going to leave that one. Uh, they've got 10 fatigue. We're going to go with the 11 fatigue Spitfire 9. Uh, and... You can see that there, so they cover them through. Now, the next squadron down the list with 56 morale, 65 squadron, Spitfire 9s, uh, if we click on them, you can see here their range is lower, so it means they're closer. Their airfield here in England is probably closer to the coast, so they're closer to the target, which means they can probably, even though they're a Spitfire 9, you can see with a 10-minute delay, they can actually join up at, near the coast and cover these guys all the way back until they're back over England, so that's going to be great. Uh, then we have some spit, or then we have some P-47D Thunderbolts, 53 of them. These are Americans, the 78th Fighter Group, uh, and we can go ahead and cut the delay to zero and see what they can cover. So if we hit them, they cover all the way into the flight and a little bit the way out. Uh, I think the P-47 actually is slightly better range than the Spitfire 9, but again, with the, uh, delay... We can actually have them cover everything from just before the French coast to over the English Channel, well over the English Channel, and we're going to go ahead and do that. Uh, we're also going to do the same thing with the 611 Squadron, uh, who is flying Spitfire 9s, but well, that's weird. I don't know why they can't cover them a little bit further out. We'll actually give them a 20-minute delay, so they're going to cover more on the back leg. So essentially they pick them up just before the target and then carry them all the way through over to the channel. And then we're going to do the 353rd fighter group. Uh, and they're going to pick them up basically just on the sort of close to the initial point all the way through to the conclusion of the flight. So it'll be 114 fighters escorting 337 bombers. Uh, I guess we've got two more fighter groups here, both with 50 morale. So we'll go ahead and have them all sort of do the same thing. Um, we'll have one group do a high escort as well, which means they're going to be flying 2,000 feet above the bombers uh, and can sort of bounce enemy fighters as they come in. So my understanding, and this could be somewhat flawed, there's two ways you can do escorts. You can see these are close escorts and these are high escorts. Close escorts mean they're flying within the formation or at the relative altitude of the formation. High escort means they're flying anywhere from whatever altitude you set above the actual target. A close escort, I believe, if an enemy, a close escort won't break away from the bombers to attack enemy fighters on their own. What they will do is if the enemy comes in to attack a B-17 group, the close fighters will have their sort of firepower added to the defensive fire of the formation and give you a better chance of shooting down those fighters. It doesn't prevent them from engaging the bombers, but it engages the enemy fighters as the bombers are being engaged themselves. So that's why you will often see when you have a heavy a uh, group of close escorts, you will see something like BF-109 attacks B-17, 334th fighter squadron or bomber squadron, 
uh, two BF-109s shot damaged, no B-17s damaged. You'll get that kind of a notification, which is essentially telling you, hey, uh, these fighters uh, were engaging the bombers, but they were destroyed by the, by the defensive fire of the formation. And that's usually how close escorts are represented. High escorts are a little bit different. They're flying above the bombers. So if the enemy fighters are coming to engage the bombers, what you'll actually often see is instead of getting that baked into the bombing defensive fire, rather than having a risk that the bomber gets engaged because they're getting in close to the bombers, you'll get a high escort uh, fighter group that will bounce them. So instead you'll see, for example, the fourth fighter group bounces uh, German fighters from Stoffel 2 uh, and shoots down two German fighters or something like that. So again, the high escorts have a better chance to intercept them prior to engaging with the bombers, uh, but it also does uh, potentially uh, allow the enemy to um, dive. You, there's a greater likelihood, it seems to me, that the enemy might actually avoid the fighter cover and getting close to the bombers. Now, I think you actually have more success shooting down enemy aircraft if the fighters are allowed to roam free a little bit, and uh, and that's why sometimes high escorts are good. Also, frankly, if you're attacking from altitude, you always have an advantage there. So you can see there, we've set up our bombing raid. We've got a total of 44 Spitfire 9s, 15 Spitfire 7s, and 143 Thunderbolts, escorting 337 B-17s of the 303rd Bomb Group. Uh, the raid's going to take off at noon, and it's going to fly at 18,000 feet. We've added the escorts. We've added the bomber units. We've picked the lead unit. We've set the primary target. We also have a secondary target in here as well, and that's all that needs. What I would also like to do is, since I'm going to be bombing this target, I probably should recon the target after the fact, and this recon flight looks good enough. We're going to go ahead and select a recon aircraft. Uh, we're going to go ahead and click on, you know, whatever the heck we want to click on. And we'll have the recon aircraft flying at about 15,000 feet, a little bit lower. Uh, whoops, actually, I'm going to go ahead and change that. So I'll click on review mission, scroll down here to the fighter group or the recon group, hit modify raid, and then I'm going to change the time. So we want this to occur three hours after the bombing raid at 1,500 hours. Uh, and that's that. In addition to that, we're also going to have a recon mission go over the oil facility in the case that we hit the secondary target rather than the primary. We'll go ahead and pick lead units, and we're going to pick another Spitfire Photo Recon 11. There you go. All right, so in addition to that, do I want to do anything else? Do we want to launch, like, a fighter sweep? We could do a fighter sweep, yes. Um, you know... Let's just fight this one out. Let's see how this plays out. Uh, we'll go ahead and play out the raid here, and then I'll talk to you a little bit more about fighter sweeps in a following video. We'll also do a, another raid on Emden or other things like that, but we're going to give the British Air Force, we're going to give the Royal Air Force a day off. So we're going to go ahead and set message levels to zero for now. We're going to fly till noon. I've got a couple of missions in... Um, in Italy going on, so we'll probably get pulled down there. But once we get to noon, then I'll go ahead and kind of stop this. You can see these other raids are going on over southern Italy. Uh, you can see we're losing some aircraft. We're trying to hit enemy aircraft at their airfields. And we did 23 enemy Axis aircraft damage to 16 of our own. Uh, we're also continuing to bomb that enemy uh, ground unit in southern Italy to prep the way for the invasion of Italy. It's actually multiple raids, including some B-17s against that uh, target. We're getting close to noon, so we're going to go ahead and stop. Go ahead and move up here. You can see the B-17s are already represented on the map. The 303rd Bomb Group are leading B-17 formation, making 127 miles per hour in the air. We're going to go ahead and message level, uh, let's say message level 3, and then we'll go ahead and continue. So you can see these B-17s are flying over at high speed. There don't appear to be... Oh, enemy BF-109s are taking off to engage. Four B-17s have been hit by flak. Eight B-17s are hit by flak. And you get these kind of notifications. They're over the target, so they're going to be bombing the target, but a lot of them are getting plastered by flak, and they're bombing the chemical works. So we'll see if they're able to effectively bomb those chemical works. There's a lot of flak in and around Paris, so we're suffering a lot of damage to our bombers, but so far none of them have been shot down. There's a fair chance that some of these damaged by flak will crash or will be picked off by enemy fighters, which are scrambling uh, and coming, you can see they're over here to the right, or to the east, 
uh, as these different bombing groups are bombing the chem works. Now, unfortunately, as they're bombing, you don't get any kind of notice to say like, oh, they're hitting their targets or they're not. Although sometimes you will see uh, they're releasing their bombs and it kind of doesn't tell you they're bombing a target. So I think you do get kind of told if they're bombing completely off target. I'm not 100% sure. I haven't seen that yet uh, in this second playthrough here, but lots of damage from Flak. Of course, the damage could be very minor as well. Yeah, and the B-17 is renowned for its ability to take damage. The one thing that makes me a little nervous... Oh, wow, two B-17s destroyed by Flak there. That's not good. Um, the one thing that makes me nervous about suffering damage from Flak is just the fact that any of these aircraft that are being damaged by Flak are probably going to fly a little bit slower than the rest of the formation. And if they trail off and are kind of left on their own and the fighters are off with the main formation, then these German fighters may have damaged B-17s to come swoop in on and, and finish off. So uh, there is that element of, of risk. But uh, again, if we were to fly higher then we would suffer less damage from flak. And potentially, here's the thing is, if you have really heavy enemy defenses, sometimes you bomb less effectively. But the flip side of that is that if you, uh, you know, fly higher to avoid the flak, well, then you're going to bomb less effectively. So it's kind of a catch-22. But I do believe there are some heavy flak towers in and around Paris, which make uh, the, the bombing of targets there more difficult than on the Dutch coast, which is what we had been bombing previously here. You can see BF-109s are chasing the formation. Uh, we had some F-190s taking off, some D-520s, which are some French aircraft, which were uh, commandeered by the Germans and also used by the Free French. Uh, you can see enemy fighters are attempting to chase our bombers, but we actually had some P-47s, which were escorting them, which are bouncing them. So you can see the 70th fighter group, which I believe was one of our fighter groups that was flying high cover, uh, was bouncing some of those enemy fighters and destroying them. You can see here we have some B-17s, which are trailing behind the main formation here, which are getting engaged by enemy fighters and destroyed. Uh, those are kind of the sitting ducks. You know, they're, they're behind the rest of the escorts and the fighters and all of that, uh, which, which kind of hurts. Uh, interestingly enough, that BF-109 engaged the formation, and the P-47s uh, were were the victims of that air battle here. So now you can see this air battle is kind of taking place here as we try and get back out of France. Uh, we're losing several bombers. Uh, again, these were bombers that were damaged by flak, which is why they're behind the rest of the formation, and the enemies are kind of swooping in on them. You also get some notices about the pilots there. You can see that pilot was captured, so he bailed out over France, and he was captured. You do have the possibility of having a pilot of yours uh, escape uh, enemy capture in Paris and get back to England. It did happen from time to time. Actually, wasn't that rare, uh, so that's interesting enough. Um, these D-520s, don't appear to be doing very well uh, against our own fighters. Again, you can see our fighters continue to swoop down and shoot down enemy aircraft. Uh, and while we have lost several of the damaged B-17s, uh, I'm pretty happy with my fighter escort's performance, uh, thus far anyway, against these enemy uh, fighters uh, that are attempting to keep up with the main formation. Damaged B-17 Flying Fortress crashes. Pretty much all those B-17s which were, oh wow, uh, enemy aircraft was damaged by his own flak, 109 damaged by his own flak. These D-520s are not faring well. We actually destroyed like 20 of them on the ground uh, as well. So uh, that's interesting to see that they're, they're really struggling here. But it looks like all of these slowed down B-17s are getting just mauled. I'm not sure how many I've lost so far. I'm going to have to take a look after the, the day's fighting is over to really kind of get a sense of that. Uh, we didn't have a nighttime raid today though, so things should be kind of clearing up here. Uh, in a moment, you can see our P-47s continue to engage the enemy aircraft. They're trailing behind the bomber formation a little bit. And there you go, 31, oh, nope, damaged B-17 crashes on the runway. Another B damaged B-17 crashes on the runway. The good news is we're not, oh, never mind. <laughs> I was going to say, good news is none of those crews or pilots are being killed, but we just got notified that, uh, yeah, actually, that one just died. Uh, unable to locate target. These are recon aircraft, by the way, that we're sending out here. So the cloud cover, if we were to go ahead and click on that, probably is too... Uh, yep, you can see southern Italy is all covered in, in cloud, so we're having trouble reconning the targets that were sent out to recon, which means you know we're not going to get a good sense of if there's enemy aircraft. You can see we're taking photos of the... 
bombing target, which we hit. So we bombed the target, and now we've got recon aircraft over the target afterwards, uh, determining whether it was, uh, you know, effectively hit or not. And uh, one of them was just damaged by flak. Just great. How about you guys just fly home rather than taking extra recon photos? I want to make sure you get back and I get the camera footage and all that. All right, we don't need to learn. We don't have any more raids going today, so let's go ahead and fast forward this thing. This is a very light day of raids. Yes, we had one large B-17 raid, probably more than we needed uh, to hit the target, uh, but it is what it is. Now it says urban damage and evidence back up to 85. I'm confused. Um, let's go to the actual target here. You can see we took recon photos today, uh, and it says we damaged the facility at 90% damage, which is good. If we take a look at aircraft losses, we did lose 11 B-17s out of 330-some-odd B-17s, so... Uh, less than 10%, but still not great. Uh, we lost six Kitty Hawk 3s, which I believe were all over Italy. One Thunderbolt, one 5B Spitfire 5, uh, Spitfire VCs, uh, four Spitfire 8s, uh, one Spitfire 9. The enemy lost, what did they lose? Four Italian RE202 Ariettes, seven Falco 2s, seven F190 Fs, four D520s, and five BF-109G6s, and one BF-109-5. So, first day, they didn't lose over 100 aircraft. 30 aircraft is probably sustainable for them on a daily basis. 100 plus isn't, but they're still averaging almost 100 aircraft loss per day. Uh, if we go to the aircraft replacements, we can see here that uh, the total number of replacements that we've received in P-47s, for example, is 45. We have 42 in pool. That means three have been drawn from the pool, but it means we're receiving far more replacements than we are losing. Uh, the Spitfire 5B, not so much. Uh, the Spitfire VC, not so much. Um, some of these others have lost more heavily as a percentage, but they're still getting replaced enough. Uh, B-17, Mustang 1s, where's the B-17s? Hurricanes, Typhoons. Uh, typhoons took a pretty bad beating in some of my bombing raids on the various plants. The B-24D Liberators are starting to build up a fair stockpile, 45, but we actually have a bombing group that's coming over very shortly with uh, B-24s. Uh, the Fortresses, we've gotten 70 replacements, 24 left in the pool, so we've lost 46 or replaced 46. Sevens, etc., etc., etc. So that you can see there's the pool and the replacements. Uh, if we go to top pilots, um, do we lose any of them? Not really sure. I wasn't really keeping track. Uh, but we still have just three pilots with two kills or more. SL, by the way, which I mentioned last time, uh, and I got it wrong, but SL is squadron leader. I assume FL is flight leader then, maybe? Um, nonetheless, here are a bunch of pilots with kills. Uh, okay, so action reports. If we go ahead and take a look here, uh, damage of the chemical facilities, 90. Out of the, I guess we should have gone, bombers. So 337 bombers, 10 lost, 3 fighters, 7 interceptors lost. Um, we lost one bomber that was attacking the troop concentrations of the 29th Panzer Grenadier, uh, and we lost uh, one bomber out of a 21 bomber formation also going against them. Uh, now we didn't get a good recon on them to figure out where they're at, but they had 33 disruption last turn, now it's down to 22. Uh, so these guys are hard to keep down. Uh, we'll have to figure that out here. Uh, but the Chemical Works factory did being destroyed, good for us. Uh, I'm not really keeping track, I probably should be, uh, for all of these uh, points that we get for industrial or strategic bombing or all those things. Uh, we'd have to take a look, although I think this total has gone down. I'm assuming Germans are repairing some of their facilities. Um, in any event, I think next turn, you know, most of the Air Forces got a day off. Uh, so I think next turn will probably be, um, you know, one that we, we really need to go full full on and, and try and um, put a serious effort on the Germans here and do a little bit more damage than we did yesterday. With that being said, guys, I think that's going to do it for this turn. That was an example of planning a bombing mission for a daytime raid against an industrial target. I think next time uh, we'll look at a night intruder mission. Perhaps we'll go back to Emden and really try and flatten that city. Uh, but until next time, guys, until that video, I hope you guys are continuing to enjoy this series looking at Gary Grigsby's Eagle Day to Bombing the Reich by Matrix and Slytherin Games, uh, back from 2009, but just recently patched earlier this year in February in a game that I enjoy quite a bit, 
and I uh, hope you guys are enjoying these videos. Let me know your thoughts below, and until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.